I'm starting at the bottom of page 149 because that continues on the next page. Possibly he entertained a few kefts or devils in his cabin later, but I did not stay to see. My lotus and I went home to our little house and rested our old bones. Again, nothing. Well, Ranifer asked himself angrily, what do you expect? After only one evening, patience, stupid one. These things take time. Something will happen this evening or perhaps tomorrow. Nothing did. However, nothing did, however. A week passed during which neither Gebu nor Weneman did anything more suspicious than walk to some wine shop after the evening meal or gamble at hounds and jackals with some crony in the privacy of their own courtyards. Setma's movements were even less interesting whenever the ancient took time to spy on him. Ranifer found the whole thing very discouraging. But Hecate's interest never flagged. It seemed rather to increase. They are lying low, he told Ranifer, one midday. They are purposely avoiding one another. Wait and see, there is some deep reason behind it, and we'll find what it is soon. Keep watch, something is sure to happen any day now. At last something did. Several days after the river began to rise, Gebu went out one evening, with Ranifer doggedly behind him, and struck straight across the city of the dead, instead of turning toward Mutra's wine shop as usual. Ranifru grew more and more excited as he followed Gebu's twistings and turnings, more and more cautious, too, as he noticed that Gebu often looked behind him in a not-quite-convincingly-casual manner. Surely something was afoot this time. Ranifru was certain of it. When he realized they were nearing the street of the Masons, and almost choked with the excitement when he saw Gebu turn in at Wenemann's gate, I must find the tree, thought. Hecate will be there, and we can watch together. Perhaps we can even hear them plotting. There was no way to pass from the street of the Masons into the alley behind it except to pass through one of the houses, or else go far around by the next cross street. After considerable fuming hesitation as to whether he should leave his post, Ranifer decided to risk it. He ran for the far corner as hard as he could run, worrying all the way over the possibility that Gebu and Wenemon might walk out the front gate and be gone before he could find them. A glance back from the corner showed the long street still empty. He dashed on, around the corner and down the cross street, hurried into the alley and was triumphantly sprinting for the tree when just beyond it a door in the wall opened without warning and Gebu and Wenemon stepped out. Ranifer stopped so abruptly that a little cloud of dust rose from his skidding feet and he almost lost his balance. They had not looked in his direction yet, but in no time at all they would. Frantically he groped at the wall beside him, clutched a latch, and pushed. In an instant he was inside some stranger's courtyard. In another instant a dog was rushing toward him, giving tongue as he came. Ranifer turned in a panic to the wall again, seized a branch of some creeper, and with the aid of a toehold in the roughness of the plaster, pulled himself up a few inches above the dog's snapping jaws. They still looked frighteningly close. He took a better grip on the vine and loosed one foot to search for a wider crack. The moment he moved the... The moment he moved the vine... The vine began mobly moved the vine began to pull away from the wall. He froze. One more moment and he would fall straight on top of the dog, or else Gebu would open the gate and find him. In that minute some dark object sailed over his head, and the dog's snarling changed to an offended yelp. Arr, arr, arr. Another object followed. This time Ranifer heard the chunk as it hit and the dog howled and made off across the courtyard. Ranifer! came an urgent whisper from somewhere above him. 
Come out, quick, they're gone. They've gone. Ranifer dropped to the ground, staggered with relief and treacherously numbed toes, flung himself out the gate and closed it. As he leaned against it, panting, Hecate dropped from the branches of the Dom Palm and ran toward him. Hurry, they've, got that, they've gone that way. We can still follow and keep them in sight. How did you, what did you do to the dog? Ranifer gasped as Hecate pulled him relentlessly down the alley. I threw down nuts at him. I could see everything that happened. I knew they were coming out that back gate, and I thought they'd catch you for sure. Come this way. There they are, ahead there. Lucky for you, I could see into that courtyard where the dog was as well as I could see into Wenemans. Where were you going so fast? I was coming to join you. They had slowed down now, and Ranifer's breath was beginning to return. I followed Gebu to the street of the Masons. Saw him go in. Well, it's turned out well enough this time, as the ostrich said when he swallowed the melon. But there had better not be a next. There was too close. That was too close for my peace of mind. Mine too. Still, I'm glad I'm not hiding beside the front gate. Still, waiting for them to come out. Look, they're turning toward the shop. Gabu's shop? Aye, it's just yonder. We'd best get out of sight a minute. They ceased whispering and flattened themselves into a shadow. A little way down the dusk-filled street, they could see Gebu and Wenemon pause at the door of the stone-cutting shop and, after a moment, go inside. Maybe Setna, maybe Setma will come now, Hecate whispered. Maybe this is their meeting place. Setma did not come, however. After a while, a torch flared inside the shop, and they could see it moving in a leisurely way here and there. It stayed some time in the scroll room, then flickered toward the place where Ranifer knew the judge's coffin stood. It is only some matter of business, Ranifer said, disappointed. The judge's entrance passage is too narrow for his coffin, or the other way around. I heard Gebu speak of it once. That's all they're talking about now. This has nothing to do with gold steel. Hecate sighed. <sighs> After lingering in a few minutes longer, he said rather lamely, Well, we have done all we can today, as one locust said to another, perhaps tomorrow. The two boys separated and went their ways. Again, nothing had happened. The Nile rose freely in the next few weeks, and in spite of the relentless heat, the gloom and the, the gloom of the god's death was gone from Egypt, and the joy of his rebirth was in every man's speech and walk and brightened eye. Navigation began again on the river, and the pace of life quickened. Page 154 Except that he shared the deep relief of his fellow Egyptians at the river's rising, Ranifer's life did not change. For a time, he and Hecate doggedly continued their spying and reporting to each other, and the ancient joined, and went, joined in when he could. The old man could not come often to the little green room nowadays because he was cutting his papyrus in a distant part of the marsh and the salt makers demanded bigger loads each day in the season of boat building and refitting. Occasionally, though, his seamed old face would appear through the curtain of reeds, and with his cheerful cackle, and his seen any hangings lately, he would come in and share his food with them. He kept a faithful, if intermittent, eye on Setma, too. The riverman had begun regular trips up and down the Nile again. The ancient always made them laugh with his mock, solemn reports, but he never found out anything, probably, Ranifer reflected, because there was nothing to find out. He himself was fast losing all faith in the spying. Never had Gebu behaved so innocently, never had a man seemed so devoted to his own courtyard, and nagging wife as Wenemon. 
Occasionally, the two met at Mutra's or at the stone-cutting shop to study the scrolls, and presumably to confer for long, dull periods over building plans. Neither went anywhere near a gold house or appeared to be acquainted with so much as a goldsmith's apprentice. Gebu was not stealing anything, that was all. He was doing nothing whatever but what but live a stonecutter's routine life. No doubt Pharaoh had paid more than usual for the temple work. Whatever the explanation, the continuing signs of wealth were not due to stolen gold. So Ranifer reasoned, and could find no fault in the reasoning, however much he wanted to, until one night, when he was wakened again, by the squeak of hinges. He lay still, listening to the stealthy pad of Gebu's feet on the stair and across the courtyard, feeling the usual tingling thrill down his spine as the gate latched softly and he knew Gebu was out in the dark street, moving among the nameless evils of the night on one of his unknown errands. What kind of errands could they be that he would brave even demons and caps to accomplish them. What could conceivably be? What could conceivably be that important, especially to Gebu? As far as Ranifer had ever been able to discover, nothing was important to Gebu, excepting gold. Excepting gold. Ranifer sat straight up on his mat and stared into the dark. Gold, of course. Gebu was after gold. Why in the name of Ammon had he not realized it before? This was when the thief was doing his thieving. Those squeaky hinges were the answer to everything. They explained the inexplicable. They wiped out the contradiction between Gebu's innocent daytime behavior and his mysteriously increasing wealth. It was no wonder. Ranifer thought, disgustedly, that all his spying and Hecate's and the ancients had gained them nothing, and everything was happening while they slept. What exactly was happening, though? Who was Gebu robbing? Could he be climbing over courtyard walls, creeping into rich men's houses, prying into their storerooms and treasure chests in the dead of night? Ranifer could not picture it. As well picture a block of granite wafting like a feather, or a hippopotamus slithering like a cat. Rich men had guards about their courtyards, and light-dozing hounds and servants who slept across the storeroom doors. Just one of Gebu's heavy footfalls, even at his stealthiest, they were audible and the whole household would be shouting the alarm. Could he be stealing from some gold house, then? But there were guards at all gold houses, too. The palace? Ridiculous, impossible. Where, then? Ranifer asked himself, exasperated. Where does he go when he sneaks out like this? Where is he going this minute? The question resounded in Ranifer's mind as if he had spoken it aloud. Slowly his eyes turned toward the gate, barely visible in the shadows of the wall. If I fouled him now, he thought, I could find out. For an instant he did not move, only stared toward the gate while visions of kefts and horrors paraded before his eyes. Then he rose slowly to his feet and stole toward the gate. There he paused again, trembling, before he reached out for the latch. The gate swung open. Another dreadful pause, and Ranifer stepped out into the street. It looked utterly strange at this hour. The moon had set already and the darkness was profound. Not a torch flickered anywhere. Not a gleam of lamplight shone from any house. Straight above were the stars, but their brilliance served only to emphasize the blackness of Egypt here below. What faint light they shed fell gloomily upon some roof corner or a waving